okay, okay. we're gonna go live and then we're gonna i'll start the zoom and yeah we were just meeting with your with uh david sanchez earlier we did an interview okay with him. okay yeah yeah I, I i met him a few times and um were you at the I, were you at western at the same time or no no i uh I, I believe he was in 99. I came in in 04, but I played baseball with his cousin. Okay, you're much younger. Okay, got you. Yeah. Okay, that's okay. Because, cool. yeah, we asked him about it. He said he wasn't sure. He knew that you guys both went to Western, but yeah. he wasn't sure about the timing. So, yeah. okay, again, hello, everyone. This is attorney Robin McCoy and attorney Tracy Martin with Political Coffee with hey, Robin hi. and Tracy. And we hey. have our special guest, Hector Santiago. And sure. I'm I'm still have my Scorpio mug Uh and I've got uh, the, the this time the hot cocoa has been mixed with the smoothie that my boyfriend made. Um, but the, the mug also says ambitious, brave, and charming. And Tracy, uh, do you have the same mug or do you have a new mug? No, I switched up because uh, we've got Hector Sa Santiago on, and you know, a Santiago's his name, and justice is his game. And so I brought my Senate mug because you heard about Derek Chauvin wanting to appeal. Uh, his case and you know we were gonna we're gonna talk with Hector at a later date about his platform on uh, justice reform, law reform, criminal justice reform, probation reform. He's got a fascinating story to tell all of you, but he's hitting those doors <laughs> and he's on a roll and he's gonna come back I think uh, yes. later this month on May 24th. We've got to clear with the campaign manager. But Hector, hello to you. Uh, oh, and yeah. a happy Cinco de Mayo. And what, you, what Mayo. you got a cup? You got and, a mug or no? Um, I, uh, I got my flyers. <laughs> uh, <laughs> That's my out, uh, He's a true and, politician. Uh, you know, <laughs> and uh, you know, I admire the great work you guys do. And oh. I know uh, Robin, you do. I, uh, I believe you did great, are still doing great work with Western International High School. Uh, yes, so. I, I, yeah, I, I did some pro because I do programs on what to do when stopped by the police, and I did a program on knowing your right when encountering the police uh -huh. and, and immigration. immigration. Yes, yes. Yeah. So you know that's great programs to have, and um, look forward into talking with you some more about that. Um, you know, these are things that I really want to talk and 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 and, and collaborate on, you know, with y'all knowledge and everybody that's community leaders and you other got, You really have us. You're, we're on the trail with you. You're like yes, dropping you off pamphlets. Like this is like, this is like, this is political coffee, y'all. Like this is yes, live yes. and interactive. Well, this is the candidate. real, real, real talk. You know, when I booked uh, <laughs> Hector Santiago for today, he did say that he was going to be on the campaign trail. He, that he was going to be canvassing and it was going to be tight. So we're going yes. to give an opportunity to come back at a later yes. date because we yes. got a lot of questions. But be, oh, yeah. to, before you go, I got two questions on a name thing. Now, your name is Hector Santiago, obviously. But do people ever confuse you with Hector Felipe Santiago, the Major League Baseball player? All the time. <laughs> okay. All the time. Um, oh, we just lost your video. Yeah. Okay. Oh, sorry. Sorry, okay, I probably hit it with my flyers. I put the mask down so you guys can see my face. Uh, okay. Um, <laughs> um, yeah, so the funny thing about that is uh, he played for the Mets and the Tigers and right. the baseball team I coach and the youth and adults were the Mets. So, uh -huh. uh, <laughs> yeah, so sometimes they're like, hey, Hector. So when he signed with the Tigers, I had about 50 friends call me and say, congratulations. And I appreciate it. <laughs> but uh, I'll give, if, you, if you don't mind, I could give you a real quick back, uh, a little bit of uh, my background, a little quick story about myself. Sure. Yeah, we're here. Yeah. You got time. So, uh, you know, Hector Santiago, born and raised in Southwest Detroit, born and raised, well, raised in the, in the church, pastor's son, um, watching my parents be those public servants um, to those church members, seeing how they um, handle those issues and um, how they're able to listen 
uh, make sure those resources are there, right? Um, growing up, I didn't understand um, what that meant. So I always said, mommy, papi, how can we have, well, I almost talk Spanish definitely. Um, <laughs> okay. Papi, Hablo um, un poco en español, muchos en francés. Okay, yeah. I took a semester of Spanish, but I'm a little, okay. I'm, I'm gonna need more classes, more culture. Yeah, so it's like, mommy, papi, como, or how can we, uh, you know, give when we don't have, right? And uh, some they always install me once that faith and that compassion of when you give, you shall receive. When you give with your heart, you shall receive, right? right. And uh, growing up, um, I mean, I wasn't perfect. Um, well, graduated from Western International High School first. Um, awesome. As we know, most diverse uh, school in uh, right. Pryor City and just like uh, the district I'm running for is the most diverse district. So a lot of people doesn't understand if you go to Western, it has 12 flags. So okay. when I was in ROTC, I never understood what the flags stand for, right? Or the pose until we started bringing out the flags of every single culture. So oh. that showed the different um, diversity we had in our school. And uh, was the first out of four um, to attend college. Okay. Um, um, wasn't perfect. Had my first daughter there. Um, uh, had a nonviolent offense and a nonviolent felony. And during that time, um, I began coaching uh, the adult league and, and youth team. And also, um, I joined the Greeny of Detroit, the program. That, oh, uh, so is that how you met Tammy Arrigan? Because she she sent me a text and she said uh -huh. she and Peyton are working with your campaign. Uh huh. Great people. Great, great, great. Uh, you know, campaign uh, gurus, I call them. <laughs> oh. And uh, they um, are. And um, I mean, when God has good people on your side and you're walking in his faith, uh, you, they'll, they'll come, right? And uh, right. I continue doing the, uh, uh, the path. Now, I went through that program, and those that are not familiar with the program, it's a program that um, deals with a lot of people with returning citizens, um, barriers to employment. You look for those resources that you may need. You may be homeless mental illness, a lot of things may be going on um, in your life, right? So right. Um, they gave me that shot. Now, a decade later, I'm running that same program I went through and oh, helping those wonderful. that may be um, um, in need, like I was. So now I, I find those resources, those, uh, um, I schedule a lot of partners to come in, those jobs to uh, help them wipe those barriers to employment because uh, what's another one? Uh, front court for those licenses. Um, we had Detroit ID come in a few times from right. the court uh, to wipe out um, what was that? Uh, their child support. So um, right. they can uh, um, go to work or not go back to prison or I mean there's a lot of things that go on when you owe child support they suspend your license as well and during that process in those 10 years Project Clean Slate came out uh, two years ago uh, 2019 and I believe uh, that's when my case was and uh, that's when my life completely changed other than when I uh, you know uh, got married and uh, <laughs> and have my kids and uh, okay. my daughter and um wow you know uh got my expungement and then i was able to attend the bill sign um where okay. the lieutenant governor governor and mayor was and um right there sitting down i uh you know i teach Sunday school. I coach baseball. I volunteer in the community. I do a lot of community events. I, um, 
around with the business owners. I mean, I do a lot of things and you're I said, really you know what? on the ground in the community, yes. right? Yes. Doing a lot trenches. of great things. And yes. I saw that photograph of you, Hector, uh, yes. with uh, uh, Governor Whitmer and the LG, mm -hmm. Garland Gilchrist and Mayor mm -hmm. Duggan. That was you. You were right yes. there with the big three. That's yes. fast. That's fantastic. Congratulations to you. Thank you. You know, for you. being yeah. a graduate of the Clean Slate program because yes. you're, uh, you know, uh, a, a personal testament to mm -hmm. success. And we mm -hmm. got to have you back on so we can yes, yes, yes. the full so we can yes. Yes. Yeah. Of yes. story. Yes, for sure. Yeah, for sure. Absolutely. And, uh, you know, it's, uh, you know, trying to be that public servant that, you know, I grew up in and understanding the issues we go through every day. Uh, I mean, I know what it is to have five dollars at the gas pump and use the other five dollars for uh, a loaf of bread, uh, oh, no. cheese and bologna. So, I mean, I know the, uh, the struggles and um, difficulties our um, constituents go through, you know, in a daily basis. So I'm no better than anybody else. Yes, I'm running, but I always say we're running. So uh you know, I really want to come back <laughs> to give you guys a little bit more, but uh, you know, I'm going up and down these stairs and I'm huffing Yeah, we're going to let you use those doors. <laughs> yeah, we're, yeah, be safe. Yeah, we'll time. let you go and, and definitely it's a pleasure to meet you, and especially sure. with all that you have a very powerful testimony. Yes. Uh, yes. Yeah, and we, and we do programming with expungement. We are working with folks to help them to find out about yes. the new law and help them get their records cleared, and then I do programs on what For to sure. do when stopped by the police, like I said, uh -huh. and then um, yeah, yeah, and, and then Hopefully we can talk more too about mental illness and, you know, these are things that I'm looking into, you know, uh, there's a lot of things that I would love to talk to you guys about um, that is on my platform and I'm very excited and uh, thank you for having me on, you know, uh, and also, you know, a big shout out to everybody that has been around my corner supporting as well, because I mean, I didn't get here alone, you know, God right, uh, help, but uh -huh. Hector, before you go, tell people how they can hit up your campaign, you yeah, know, they want your website. Volunteer. Okay, yes. So you can, uh, yeah. So you can go, well, you can't see it. So no, we could. We could, we could see it. Oh, you could? Okay. Or actually, here. Yeah. Sorry. It's so different uh, not being in front of my computer. and But, you know, I had to say hi to you guys, you know. I uh, really appreciate you stopping oh, out. Hector Here Santiago, Hector Santiago. Hector Santiago for Detroit. Dot com. Yep, that's the website. Then uh, okay. email. Okay. H Santiago two zero two one at gmail dot com. Campaign office. And then, of course, August third. But we would love to have uh, you guys to volunteer and to help the movement because, at the end of the day, it takes all of us to get the changes that we really need here in the district. Like I say, um, nobody will be ever forgotten again, you know, and um, that's a big thing that I'm gonna focus on, bringing that unity and uh, can't wait to give you guys the whole spill and talk Spanish with y'all. I'm very okay. excited, you know? Yeah, <laughs> you know, so I'm out here more Spanish, okay? Right. We go, we go, we go practice. We're going to learn it. We're going to, you know, hola, como estas, you know. Seguro, you probably seguro, won't say you know? beaucoup mieux. But you know what, Rob, right. a lot of French. Hector, on your yeah. website, you um, have, uh, it's in Arabic too. It's in, you have the, Arabic, yes. Arabic. Yes, because, uh, you know, we have here in District 6, you know, I'm not going to say Southwest, you know, we're District 6. We're just not, um, one side, one, one, one little small pocket. We are eight zip codes. Okay. So you have, okay. Um, uh, different diversity. So you have your, um, Arabic, you have your Hispanic and, or Latino, and then you have your African American and you also have, um, your Americans as well. Right. So it's a very diverse district. You have, um, Dominicans, you have Cubans, <laughs> You have, okay. uh, wow, uh, what the mantecos, you have everything around here. So, I mean, and if you want pupusa, you want everything, you come to Southwest Detroit, you want Puerto Rican, you go to Rincon Tropical. Uh, but you're Puerto I mean, Rican, 
I'm Puerto Rican. Yes. Okay. Puerto Rican. Puerto Rican. Puerto Rican um, but um, what what I say is I'm Latino because we're all united. We we right. are all one culture, and there's no me uh, is all we and. I support our local businesses and, uh, you know, like, for example, you know, I love eating uh, over here at, uh, wow, uh, uh, Nacimientos, man. It's oh, delicious. Yeah, nice. And and he has uh, a beautiful, you know, I was talking to him and um, just, and I'll be quick. He has a beautiful mural, okay? And uh, yeah. there's a picture on my Facebook where you see me, like, hitting elbows with him and smiling. Right. And he explained that mural to me. And it touched me, you know, and I text him like, hey, um, thank you so much for sharing that history, that family history, because that was actually him and his dad, you know, oh. in that mural. So a lot of these murals um, symbolize something. So it's all right. about talking to business owners and it's just amazing, you know, and, you know, I mean, you got different kind of foods around here, Cuban, Puerto Rican. Dominican. You making me hungry. I need you need to give us a list so we can come over there and get some food. Okay. Anytime you guys can email me. Anytime you know because uh, I mean, um, it's very it's very diverse over here. You know, and then you know if you want to see a good baseball game from high school, it's Western International High School. You know, right. great coaches there. That's who trained me. Juan Carlos, Mike. Um, I mean Nigel. He's a police officer, and uh, Matos. And then uh, you got. Angel Garcia, he passed away. Lord, God rest his soul. That I was a freshman when he was Angel Garcia. When Wait, he, when uh, did he pass away? Because he was there when I when I came and I was working with the well, students. That, that's there. his son. That's his son. Oh, Angel Garcia. oh yes, okay. Yes, that's his son. And I played baseball with him. So, okay. uh, <laughs> so his father actually, I was his last um, team. That was my freshman okay. year, and I had the honor to play under him, and then. Coach Juan and uh, Mike came in and installed that uh, leadership in us, you know, those young men. So just being able to be around programs like that, it's a blessing. So, I mean, I got so much stories and, and great things and um, so much stuff to talk about, especially door knocking and all the uh, issues that are going on. You know, yeah. I would love to share with you guys. So when I talk with the campaign manager, um, hopefully we could get on, but yeah, for sure. You know, walking around for sure. You know, there's a lot of, uh, forgotten areas that we need to wake up and, 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 um, really focus on because, uh, you know, there's a lot of blight and, and, and I mean, they feel forgotten and they're losing hope, you know, and, um, just being able to, um, um, connect with them again and give them that hope that, Hey, you know, you, you, you have a voice, just trust me. I'm a different candidate. You know, I'm not going to sell you the sunshine and, and sell you a rainbow and, and paint the, the gold, uh, um, road. I okay. just want to be honest, you know, I, that's You're all real. they ask for. You know, you got it. that. I mean, you just got some, what you can do, you know, and, and be honest, what you can do is at that position. And they really, uh, respect that, you know? So, right. uh, you know, that's all I can really do. I, Okay, okay, here. Hey, yes. Oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> they want to talk to me. So uh, I'll let you guys go. I appreciate you guys. Muchas gracias. Uno, no. Y uh, talk to you guys soon. Okay. All okay, right. Hasta luego. Okay, bless you guys. See you later in May. Good luck out there. Okay. Yeah, see you later. Muchas Be gracias. safe. Talk to you soon. You. Hasta luego. See you Hasta later. Hasta luego. Adios. <laughs> Adios. All right. Adios. Adios. Hola. Okay. Bye. Hey. Uh, my name is Hector Santiago, and um... <laughs> well, that was folks, um, you had well, it right here. We were, well, I felt like I was on the campaign trail with him. That was right. like, in action. That was, that was interesting. Um, you could see he was out there. We just had a uh, chat with a um, District Six candidate for Detroit City Council, Hector Santiago. Uh, not the major league baseball player, but he says he said a moment ago he's been mistaken for Hector Felipe Santiago, who did play for the Detroit Tigers, the Mets, the Twins, the Angels, uh, the whole nine. He's a free agent now. But um, yeah, Hector Santiago, we can't wait to have him back so that we can really do a deep dive into what his take is on all the issues. And uh, do you remember him from Western International High School, Robin? 
Um, I, there were a lot of kids there. I don't, I don't, you know, I don't, I don't know. Cause there were a lot. I mean, I was, but I was working with a specific student that had issues. And so we were having meetings, but we did do that program that we did that program a couple of years ago. So okay. with, with the, with the whole, with the students and it was, it, it, yeah, I, that's what I miss. I miss being able to go and do programs in person. I mean, we can do virtual, but that's, you know, it's different. It's not the same as being there and engaging. I'm a people person, you know, just like teaching. I like to teach in person and, uh, you know, it's been an adjustment to be teaching virtually. It's, it's just a different uh, scene. Yeah, you know, looking at glass screens, I mean, it um, it can wear on you. You know, there is such a thing as Zoom fatigue, they say. And, uh, you know, we had another candidate on earlier, David Sanchez, also running for District 6. And he said that he uh, completed his degree uh, virtually right alongside his children who were doing remote learning. So um, I don't know. I think there are aspects of... Um, you know, video conferencing that are going to stay with us even after the pandemic ends. And I, gosh, I hope it does end someday soon um, because of the convenience, you know, like at court. Um, right. You know, Oakland County has always had judge online where a lawyer could, um, you know, use their computer or camera to uh, participate in the hearing. Uh, you know, that's typically for lawyers who are far away. Um, or, you know, as long as you pay, you don't really have to have any particular reason, but you could do it. And so I just say all that to say that I think some aspects of this are going to stay. Um, you know, well, I would much of- rather at, in, instead of having to physically go to three different courts in three different jurisdictions, I would much rather have three devices that have Zoom up. That That is actually better, safer. So I I agree. I think that some of these technological changes are going to stick with us because for pleas, you don't have to be there. I mean, for a jury trial, yeah, I think you need to be there. Bench trial, you need to be there. So yeah, there are some nuances that which I think should stay with us. And, uh, you know, I'm hoping that we can get more uh, progressive offers from the prosecutors uh, so that, because I believe most of the cases that come through the criminal justice system are, are, can be pleas, but it's just like, there has to be some reasonableness on the prosecution side. And then there are some that are clearly going to go to jury trial or bench trial. And okay, then let's, let's just, but let's just deal with the ones that are plea, have plea potential and get those out of the way, you know? Yes, because those go quick. I mean, I have done the trifecta where I have appeared in Wayne County, Oakland County and Macomb County in one day. And, you know, you're traveling and it can be dangerous because you know right. not that anybody's speeding but you know it's just hectic it's a and, lot you know, it's a lot on your body right. physically to go that's why they talk about litigators have higher rates of heart attacks because when you're running if you're running from here literally running i mean you know you're not speeding but you're you're stressed out because you're trying to get especially if you're scheduled to be in three places at one time at the same right time. exactly so you know we were talking with Hector santiago earlier He's going to come back. We um, had suggested a date of Wednesday, May 26th, because now Political Coffee is airing weekdays. We stream weekdays. Although this Saturday, we are going to do a special episode of Political Coffee where we're returning to Saturday, uh, this Saturday, May the 8th at 2 p.m. Eastern time, Ed Sarpolis, the founder and director of Target Insight, is going to bring his polling data about reparations in Detroit, local reparations. And he's also going to be talking about redistricting. So that's this Saturday at 2 p.m. It's a special, um, but- Those are definitely coffee. two hot topics. Yeah, redistricting and reparations. You know, I'm reading an interesting book about um, federal reparations, um, you know, connected with HR 40, it's called uh, From Here to Equality. So I'm really looking forward to that discussion with Ed Sarpolis. Um, He's a good friend of mine. I regard him as a polling guru. I've had him on um, a number of shows when I had my own radio show, and he's fascinating to speak with. I could talk with Ed or talk to Ed Sarpolis for hours 
about his findings and he's got some you know big news about redistricting and some other things that are cooking you know you just get these little inside uh the kernels of juicy you know political tea you know and oh. uh so he's going to I mean, be I'm on looking, i'm Saturday. looking forward to that and yeah i've done yeah. some videos on my robin legal youtube and the robin legal website on HR 40 and I, I we did in my class we covered uh Ta-Nehisi Coates essay on the case for reparations so we have had discussions about reparations uh I've actually had an essay I had the kids do it at, every time every I've taught three times and I on my class and we've had the kids write about reparations so yeah I'm definitely looking forward to the interview on Saturday and I know you and I also wanted to talk about some of the headlines that have been in the the news the local news um, you well, what's alerted. your top headline from local news and then national news for this week so far? We're in the middle of the week. So what, what, you know, what in are your the top middle headlines? of the week? Gosh, I mean, well, you alerted me to the one that was happening in the 36th district with the, with the judge and, um, the whole issue about, uh, he guess it's my understanding. He was chastising somebody about what they were wearing and, he was recorded and there was somebody was in the audience. I, I don't know that they were a lawyer, maybe a, another member of the public that, that advocated for the person who was at work and had to wear their work clothes. And uh, you and I have talked about this before, about this. I, I have had the issue with wearing a head wrap and I've had some judges at the 36th district ask me to remove my head wrap, even though I've worn them culturally, they're gaylies. Um, I, I'm Afrocentric and I've worn them since I was a little girl and I've worn them all over the state and in the courts. And I, I've been in front of all kinds of judges of different colors and ethnicities, but I've had three times at the 36th district where I was asked to remove my headscarf from black females. The first mm -hmm. time I was able to keep it on because I explained that I wear it for spiritual cultural reasons. I mean, I, I'm not Muslim. I don't wear them every day, but I do wear, would wear them often. And I, I was actually kicked out of the, the second time I was kicked out of the courtroom, um, just basically booted out uh, and I was wearing a headscarf and it, it's not a bandana. It's, um, I mean, I'll wear it. I know we've talked about some future shows bringing on Representative Sarah Anthony, who's uh, working to pass the legislation, the Crown Act that deals with hair discrimination for black women. Uh, and, you but know, that's I- part of hair discrimination, don't you think? If, if a judge won't allow you to wear a culturally centric head wrap, I believe it is, and I believe that the Crown Act should be, they should include uh, the head wrap with that. I know when I talked to some of the national folk about it at the National Bar, like they had a comp, they had a, a virtual uh, event, they were saying that they were not including head wraps, but for me, Again, growing up Afrocentric, wearing, I've worn Afrocentric attire. I went to Catholic school. I wore it to Catholic school. I would wear head wraps. I would wear braids. I never had nobody. I've never had any time where anybody said I had to take off what I was wearing and it was inappropriate. Uh, it, and, and to actually have it, 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 to, it, coincidentally to have it happen to myself, it, it, it was an intense experience. And so I am, I'm, I'm working with groups, advocacy groups, black women lawyers, women lawyers in Michigan to take these issues on to, we, you know, we need to change the judicial code of conduct because the judicial code of conduct, uh, you, you know, we started talking about the issue with Judge Giles with him asking, telling a person that if they're not dressed appropriately, that he'll, he'll lock them up or, you know, he'll make sure that they're, if they don't dress appropriately, he's going to lock them up and they'll be wearing jail fatigues. And, um, so my issue with the head wrap it made me compelled me to read the judicial code of conduct, which says that the judges cannot discriminate based on race, gender, um, you know, they, they can't, but it also says that they can dictate the attire of the litigants. So the lawyers, the members of the public and their staff. And so, but this issue, like, I know when talking to some of the folks about the hair discrimination, they... And they're saying that there's uh, under Elliot Larson that there's protections in place to prohibit race discrimination and that our hair, the way we wear our hair, if we want it, whatever way we want to wear it, straight, braids, natural, Afro, that that's part of our race and ethnicity and that's discrimination. And uh, the argument has also been made that the head wrap too, wearing a head wrap 
It's not a bandana. It's not a rag. It's an actual African gaily. And I have Afrocentric attire. And, uh, you They're know. They're beautiful. It's very beautiful. For right. example, remember when we hosted and co-moderated a special in uh, March, March 27th on the new clean slate law rolling out in Michigan, which it, it has rolled out. It's effective now, effective April 11th. And we featured an illustrious panel of distinguished guest lawmakers and lawyers. And one of the members of the panel was attorney Victoria Burton Harris, who ran for Wayne County prosecutor and is now the, I believe the deputy of uh, Washtenaw the county prosecutor, assistant pr prosecutor. She's like, you know, one of the top prosecutors. And she wore this beautiful turban. And right. so what's wrong with that? It looks professional. You know, when, um, okay, let me preface my remarks that I'm going to say now. So I've been on this genealogical study and, you know, I've discovered aspects of my heritage, which, you know, I had an inkling of, but it was confirmed. And one of the aspects of my ancestry is that it did confirm that I am MENA, M-E-N-A, Middle Eastern North African from Algeria and Morocco. And so recently I have been wearing a hijab when I go out. And so this makes me think, you know, with the head wrap, would anyone, a judge ever tell a woman to remove a hijab. I don't think so. But I have read stories of judges telling women to remove a burqa, you a know. Burqa. Yes. I hate covers. Yeah, you know, but that is um, cultural. It's religious. If you're Muslim, um, I just think that there needs to be respect because you have people going into court wearing yarmulkes and no one says anything to them about it. What's, what's the difference? Why can't you wear a a head wrap, you know, a cultural head wrap. It looks neat, it looks professional. Like you said, it's not some head rag. I have been in court with clients who have come to court wearing bonnets, you know, like you wear at home. And when I say a bonnet, I mean like a silk bonnet that women wear to keep their hair together at night. And um, that's probably, you know, maybe going a little too far, but a cultural head wrap, I don't see what the issue is with that. And um, regarding the incident at 36th District Court the other day, well, my husband alerted me to it. He said, oh, you know, there was an incident on Zoom with the judge telling a construction worker that he can't wear a t-shirt even though he's on the job and he's trying to hold down his job. And it was clear from the video from Zoom court that the gentleman was at at his job. And so I have two things about this. The person who called out Judge Giles, no one knew who she was. And the, the litigant who uh, was berated by the judge didn't know who she was. And in fairness to Judge Giles, he did not hold that against the litigant who was wearing a collar, collarless shirt, a t-shirt. Um, nobody knew who this woman was who called out Judge Giles and said, you know, that's effed up. And she called, she, well, I don't know if she was calling him the B word, but she used the word B, okay? And um, how does somebody like that get admitted to a Zoom court, okay? How does the, she get admitted to a Zoom hearing? You know what I'm saying? When you go into the waiting room, the clerk checks you out to find out who you are and if you have any business being on that Zoom court hearing, right? So how did she even get I, access? I, you know, there have been concerns. The criminal defense bar has expressed concerns about um, this issue with some of the judges berating people for the way that they dress. And, you know, I've taken it up with Judge McConaughey because um, based on my own experience and what I've seen exhibited with some of my clients, because I feel it's unfair if people, it's a lot of our clients, it's the first time they've ever come to court. They're not receiving a notice saying to them, okay, you're coming to court, you need to dress a certain way. Sometimes they don't know about that until they actually get into court. And for judges to say, well, if you don't dress a certain way, I'm going to show you how to dress. I'm going to, I feel that's very harsh. I mean, I know Judge Giles was a, a private attorney and 
uh, a, a excellent private attorney. And he's very considered actually one of the more progressive judges that he's a fair judge, like, cause there's issues come, some people are concerned about some of the judges coming in there. They won't berate the clients about what they wear, but they, they're not fair on the cases. Like Judge Giles will dismiss some of the cases that- Well, that's great. That's great that he's a progressive judge. Like he'll dismiss judge some Trump. of the cases that but he doesn't cases. give him the right to berate people who are working class, who are middle class. Now, I myself have gone around with the Judge Giles. I was representing a Latina litigant and she came to court um, in her best. I told her to wear her best and she didn't have much money. And she wore a collarless shirt. It was a black t-shirt. And Judge Giles uh, attempted to berate her. And I, you know, said, hold up, wait a minute. Now my client doesn't have a lot of money. She doesn't have money to be looking like she stepped off a bow, uh, you know, cover. So, um, you know, that ended that discussion, okay? And I just think that is completely unfair, especially in this climate where we're in a pandemic. And so to threaten a litigant with a lockup, you know, in a, a potentially a COVID environment, it just is not a good look. And I heard what the Chief Judge McConnell said uh, on uh, Fox 2 News uh, last night that it, you know, didn't make the court look very good. And he was uh, calling for a meeting. I think it is bad optics. And the other side of that is it's Zoom court. I mean, there've been lawyers that I've heard, you know, showed up to Zoom court uh, topless, you know, not women, men, you know, wearing a bare chest or, you know, lawyers, you know, inappropriately dressed. But for this guy who was on the job, trying to hold down his construction job, it was clear he was on the job, um, to threaten him with jail, that's out of order. I but like like I said, I have I have seen these issues. I know before the pandemic, we in the with the criminal defense bar, we had an attorney's lounge at Frank Murphy where you could you, we could take donated clothes to give to our clients to dress appropriately when they because they're coming, they're showing up. They don't know how to how you know. I, I think the issue is. It, we're we're putting upper and middle class standards on people. Like if people had the money to buy the proper clothes, it's like you got to think about they wouldn't even be in trouble. Some of yeah, them are problem, in trouble because of poverty. Like they what's don't have problem? they don't have money. They they do commit crimes because of poverty. If they had the wherewithal to dress appropriately, they wouldn't be it getting in trouble. That. It goes beyond that because what is appropriate? As long as you're coming to court and you're clean and neat and you're not wearing a t-shirt that has profanity on it or see-through top or mini skirt up to your butt or booty shorts then that's proper to me because we're living in a different age where people don't have funeral clothes or church clothes. When you go to funerals today, a lot of people are showing up in t-shirts and casual. The thing is that you're there, okay? That you make it to court, whether it's on Zoom or in person, you're clean, you're neat. Um, you know what? I remember when I was in court in front of, I think it was Judge Colombo or Judge Callahan. No, I think it was Callahan. And this lawyer made a big deal about how his client showed up to court, you know, in a three-piece suit and the other litigant, you know, looked like he was cleaning out his garage. And, um, you know, the judge said, well, it makes no difference to me. This is in circuit court. He showed up to court. He's clean. He's neat. He's not offensive and looks like your client's got on his funeral suit. Next. I mean, that I was see, the right I, attitude. I think the issue is what I, it's about uniformity, but, but what the judges take the lead from is the judicial code of conduct, which says that they get for their, what, this is what's been communicated to, to me when I have, uh, what was not just communicated, it's because I read the judicial code of conduct, but what's also been communicated to me is that the judges get to dictate in their courtroom, they are the law of the land. So they get to dictate the rules for their respective courtrooms. And I think that's the issue too, is that there's not uniformity in how the courtrooms are in So you go into one courtroom and, you know, like I discovered, I could wear a head wrap in one courtroom, go into another one. But I mean, it, it, to me to have three black, well, the first judge, I'm not gonna go on her cause she didn't, I, she let me keep my head wrap on. But the other two judges, 
to tell me I can't wear head wraps that I've worn since I was a little girl. And that to me, I, I was just, I, I was, you know, cause you, you, ex you expect uh, racism from prejudice from white folk. You know, my parents were like, look, you gonna have to deal with some prejudice and pick your battles. Sometimes, you know, you, you can't fight every battle, but if, if something really bothers you, you need to deal with it. I had a situation in high school where I wore a shirt saying the hardest job in America is being a black woman. And I was chastised by some of my classmates and I wrote a letter to the school and then I did a program. I brought in a, a expert about, he was African-American talking about cultural issues and sensitivity. That's what I did there. And so I think that's what I think needs to happen at the 36th district court is they need to have a meeting um, with the criminal defense bar, black women lawyers in Michigan and talk about cultural sensitivity. And I mean, it, the thing that is just so shocking to me is that this these are black judges and they're demonstrating a lack of cultural sensitivity to black litigants. And, and it's like, it's the 36th district. You would think it would be a more progressive court because it's it's black judges and that they would be more enlightened. You know, uh, you know, my background is cultural anthropology. I've traveled. I'm not shocked. Years. I'm not shocked by it though, Robin, because remember when we both uh, co-interviewed Yale law professor Eric Foreman, who is the author of a book called Locking Up Our Own. And the premise of that book basically is that, you know, you have these black prosecutors and judges and they're just as hard, if not harder on uh, black defendants than anyone else. So I'm not shocked. I'm not shocked many of these judges, uh, not all of them, but some of them uh, have acute black robe syndrome or black robitis. Correct. And uh, they're out of touch. David LeGrand, uh, State Representative David LeGrand, we talked to him about this just a few weeks ago. And uh, he says, you know, these judges, um, many of them, they're out of touch. They have six figures. They have uh, middle class income or upper middle class income. And they just cannot relate to what it takes for litigants to get to court on time or some of them have to catch buses they don't have money for uber or lyft and they just are completely out of touch and uh you know i urge people to go back and watch that interview because uh david legrand was talking about his quest for eliminating cash bail in michigan and right. um yeah but not all judges are like this but it's the ones that do these things that really stick out and really you know sort of uh, keep this mindset going that, oh, you know, court's a scary place and, you know, they don't want to have to deal with some surly judge. And it's, it's bad. It's bad for law, you know, the state of what we do, uh, the whole court system. Uh, judges are supposed to exude a judicial demeanor and they're supposed to teach everyone who uh, treat everyone who comes before them with respect a decorum and be on time to the bench as well, respect people's schedules. And again, this threat of locking somebody up because they're on the job and wearing a collarless shirt, that is out of order. Uh, I think that that is completely wrong. But you know, at 36 District Court, there's a, a, a couple of new judges hitting the bench thanks to Governor Gretchen Whitmer making appointments. She announced it today uh, someone I know, Sean Perkins, who is um, um, hotshot attorney, Todd Perkins' brother, was just appointed to the bench at 36th District Court and also um, um, court magistrate Millic Millicent Sherman, who has run for judge before. She also received an appointment from Governor Whitmer. And so she will now go from magistrate to full-fledged judge at 36 District Court. What do you think of those appointments, Robin? Well, I wanna congratulate both Sean and Millicent. And uh, we wrote, Black Women Lawyers in Michigan wrote a letter for Sean Perkins. I know my aunt Virgie wrote a letter as well. Um, you know, and, and actually, since we're talking about this issue about judicial decorum and Black robitis, that's something that we talked, actually referenced in the letter that really? there are judges that have black robe syndrome and that we believe that Sean would be different, that he would, I specifically like, so black women lawyers, where we have is we have it set up where uh, if you're a member, if you're active with our group, 
we we will evaluate you and we we can conceivably write a letter for you if you're trying to get a judicial appointment on the state level the federal level we've written level we've written some letters for people that are in consideration for the u.s attorney's positions but specifically on this issue about judges i have i you know i'm a, i'm a i was a long distance runner so i'll be beating my drum until i see resolution just like with reparations i'm gonna keep talking about when we're talking about reparations we're gonna be talking about the george floyd police and that we're gonna keep talking about it until we see justice actually happen so with the in the head wrap issue too i mean because I, I don't i don't fight every every little thing i don't fight every little thing but when something resonates within me and i feel really upset and it's not just about me with the head wrap issue, I was hurt, told that the, the judge that booted me out the courtroom also booted uh, Linda get out of the courtroom who was wearing a head covering and who was a cancer survivor. And that's wow. when I said, that's when the, the message, I was like, no, no, you can't let this go. I've emailed people about it. We've got committees, legislative groups talking about what we've got to do to change the code of conduct. Because what, what I will say as a defense attorney, I mean, you and I both as attorneys, we want to see judges that are going to be fair and impartial. We want to have righteous judges. We want to have a 36th district or wherever it is. You want to have judges that if the prosecution has not met the elements of the offense, that they're willing to dismiss the case. Now that that's why people, there are people that are torn over the situation with Judge Giles because he is a, a progressive judge and will he's not afraid to dismiss the 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 weak cases um but this there is this issue people have been upset about the whole the way he has demeanor you know being grouchy and all that kind of stuff and and concerns about black robe syndrome and and then it's 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 it's, it's people are torn because he he has hosted some of our black woman lawyers events at his, he's a, I, when he was a private attorney, he was a really nice guy and a nice attorney. And so- No uh, one is saying that Judge Giles does not have great qualities. He wouldn't be on the bench if he wasn't an awesome, phenomenal person, okay? To become a judge, that is an achievement. It is an honor. It is the position that lends itself to prestige, but, there are some judges who commit black robe itis. Okay, they have it. They have black robe syndrome. I don't know what happens to them once they ascend to the bench. They tend to lose touch. They lose touch um, with what it's like to be an attorney, a working attorney who's running from courtroom to courtroom, courthouse to courthouse, and is trying to make a living. And they lose touch with the litigants that appear before them, some of them who may not have the means to even be able to afford an attorney, okay? And they, but they still have a right to access to justice and to be treated with respect and have the same outcome, whether they are represented by counsel or not, because I have seen some judges not all give uh, pro se litigants or litigants who appear improper without counsel, short shrift. And it makes a difference. I think people know that, that they, you know, they will have perhaps a better outcome if they go into court with an attorney. Um, it's not always that way. Look, I've seen people represent themselves and they beat the lawyer, you know, um, it, but um, it's a, it's an issue. It's a serious issue. It needs to be addressed. And I hope that it will be. It seems as if uh, Chief Judge uh, McConnell over there at 36th District Court takes it seriously. I saw his inter interview last night on Fox 2. He's taking up the matter very seriously. And uh, we'll see what the, um, what the outcome is. But um, I hope I don't ever hear about a judge berating someone because they appear on Zoom court of all places in a t-shirt that they need to wear for their job. That is inappropriate. That's and, not- And, and it's, it, what do they say? What's done in the dark will come to light because there have been concerns. Defense attorneys have been concerned about some of the behaviors of the judges. And uh, it's, and so that, I think that's why some of this stuff comes to light. So we can hopefully, change just like we talk about with police misconduct and changing the culture of the police there are some places with the judges that some of the culture needs to be changed and uh for the better i think uh people have asked me about why don't you run for judge or get appointed as a judge and you know i've talked about i became a lawyer to help the brothers in the system the sisters you know folks in the system 
And I'm not saying I would never want to apply for a judgeship, but because of some of the behaviors I see from some of these people that get appointed as judges or they run for judge and some of them let it go to their head. Some of them are, they're good people, but then when they, something about putting a robe on, it's kind of discouraged me from wanting to, cause I'm like, I, I'm a, I'm a spiritual Christian woman. I want to help people. I understand their rules. I'm not saying the judges need to follow. They, they need to tell people to follow the rules. Just like I had my mama, nurse Pam, you know, she was a nurse Pam. If I didn't follow the rules, she was going to whoop me. She was going to do, you know, she was going to handle it. And she scared me more than anything. She didn't always whoop me. I mean, she, I appreciate that there are rules and there's the law. My mom was the law. If I didn't have the law, I wouldn't, she taught me how to respect her and my father respect for your parents, respect the teachers, respect the police, respect everybody, the judges, lawyers, respect, respect right, yourself. But sometimes the law needs to be reformed if it's unjust. I mean, that's why we have had uh, the clean slate law roll out here in Michigan to give people opportunities for expungements. If uh, they have, you know, what is it? It's up to three felonies and unlimited misdemeanors, pretty right. much. Three felonies. No and, drunk driving or, you know, uh, but, um, you know, because people can't get jobs and they can't get housing if they have a record. So that's great. This is the age of law reform. And at the end of the day, I do believe that judges and jurists must remember that ultimately the taxpayers pay their salaries and that they are public servants, that they are civil servants and they are to serve on the bench with respect and judicial demeanor and decorum. That's what they have to remember. I really think that all lawyers and judges should take their oath of office every year to remind us of what our duties are and what our roles are as lawyers and judges in this state and across the country. Right, right. No, I agree with you. I think, uh, cause there's not even, you look only 5% of lawyers are black. It's not even, I mean, I know in Detroit, we see a lot of black lawyers and judges. So it makes you just think that there's so many, but no, on the whole scale of things, there are not that many. And uh, we definitely need to increase the number of black attorneys, women attorneys, women judges, black judges, but we need to, they need to be good examples. They need to be like, you know, like my mentor, Judge Deborah Thomas, um, you know, Judge Margie Braxis, who's retired, uh, Judge Salinthia Latoy Miller. We have some really good models of judges out there. And um, I, I think that the other judges need to look to them and like, think about it. Like, don't just become a judge because you want a salary and you higher salary and you want to, you're in a position of power. You, you need to really take that old serious, you know, look at the facts of the situation and that the facts don't meet the elements, dismiss the case. Now, if they meet the elements of the case, then okay. Then the person needs to be bound over and, you know, handle it, follow the On rules. On the criminal side. But that, right. I would say that that is uh, so far this week, that's my local story of the, of the midweek the issue at 36 district court. Uh, and um, you know, I find it uh, rather ironic that somebody who probably wasn't even supposed to be in that Zoom court here and called out the judge, which uh, made this uh, video go viral because you know, you're not supposed to record, be recording those Zoom proceedings. I know. Somebody recorded that and, and, and somebody let that that individual in who called out the judge and, you know. Well, you're making me think from what you're saying, attorney Martin, I'm, you're making me think maybe somebody did it intentionally. Maybe they heard about the issue and got in there and intentionally recorded it. I don't, I don't, or maybe it was a fluke. I don't, you know, I don't know. I don't know, but that's an interesting point that you raised. And then in terms of my national story of the midweek, I mean, there's so much going on out here in the political world. Um, Oh, I do have a, a, a tie for a local story, but I will say um, quickly, my national story of the week is that Facebook um, upheld its decision. Donald Trump cannot get back on Facebook or Instagram because, you know, Facebook owns Instagram now. They merged. And um, so that's going to be interesting going into 2022, because I think that a lot of Republicans, conservative Republicans who are for free speech, First Amendment, they're taking issue with that. And that's going to get the gander up headed into 2022 and 2024 uh, because people see that as an infringement on free speech, even though it's Facebook. Um, and, you know, the argument is, oh, it's privately owned, but 
newspapers are privately owned too. And, you know, people get to exercise free speech, you know, if they write a column or, you know, comments. So that's my national story of the week. And then the time for the local story of the midweek is former council member Gabe Leland of District 7. He um, pled guilty on Monday of um, felony misconduct in office. He was represented by attorney C. Fishman, a hotshot uh, preeminent criminal defense attorney who worked out this uh, great deal for him. Although he hasn't been sentenced yet, Gabe Leland will be sentenced on June 7th. The plea agreement um, is set forth where Gabe Leland will serve no jail time. And you know the allegation was that he accepted uh, half of a $15,000 bribe uh, to fix a certain something. And um, so he accepted $7,500. Uh, they it got converted into a campaign contribution. But my point is this, you know, we had another council member, actually Detroit City Council President Monica Conyers, who went to federal prison, Alderson a prison camp for 37 months because she was alleged to have accepted a $6,000 bribe in connection with the Cinegro scandal. And, uh, you know, so there's a lot of um, discussion and debate about a legal double standard. Black politicians get treated one way and white politicians get treated another way. Some people I might say, so. oh, it depends on the lawyer. But still, I no, mean, I think it's, it, it shows it's also it, it can it be who the lawyer is, is a factor. But we're in a racial caste system here in America. And that's and it's that's reflected. That's it's unfair. You can't have you have a double standard like the with Kwame Kilpatrick getting 28 years. And then some of the folks connected to the Trump, they didn't get as much time and they did just as much or worse than what Kwame did. And 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 then. When you talk about a national story, I would say my midweek story is about the whole drama with Liz Cheney and them trying to remove her from her seat. Even though she's telling the truth, she's she's being righteous in her position and they're trying to take her out. And I wouldn't be surprised if we see her running for president or, or I'm, I think it's going this their efforts to get remove her are probably going to backfire against them. You know, it's going to be interesting. It's going to be interesting, but Republicans have the right to decide who their leadership is going to be, and I believe that they're going to take her out, and I don't see a future for Liz Cheney running for POTUS ever, so um, we'll see what happens with that, but that, yeah, that has been all in the headlines, this whole thing with Kevin McCarthy and Liz Cheney. Oh, and there was a leak of Kevin McCarthy's comments about Liz Cheney, where I think he said something about, I can't take it anymore. I've I had can't it take her anymore. Time. Right. And see, <laughs> you know, again, it, it, how much of that is really McCarthy or is it Trump or the Trumpers influencing what what's happening in the party? Well, I mean, Trump, uh, from where I sit, is still a leader when it comes to the Republican Party. And a, a source of mine who is a Republican says, you know, there is this uh, rift in the Republican Party and because you have establishment Republicans and then you have these like Trumpers and it's kind of ripping the party apart. But, you know, uh, by the same token though, on the other side of the equation, Democrats are going to have an issue with far lefters and um, ultra progressives who are not satisfied with what they call establishment Democrats. I mean, you have um, members of the squad I mean, some people would say the squad is not even far left, that they're more, you know, going moderate. Um, we would like to have Rashida Tlaib, Congresswoman Rashida Tlaib on from the 13th Congressional District to talk about some issues, not just with the squad, but what's going on with redistricting yeah, uh, and other that. issues. But um, it's going to be a problem in both parties, frankly. Uh, there are a lot of uh, people who are upset with how both parties are being run. And there are, frankly, a lot of calls out there to form new parties. And um, there's someone out there try trying to form the Patriot Party on the Republican side. And uh, we'll see. We'll see where it ends up. Uh, it, yeah, we'll yeah folks, stay tuned to Political Coffee for because we'll be having we'll be talking about more of these issues. Yeah, I know in the news they were talking about the civil they call it the civil war in the Republican Party yeah. That's happening. So, yeah. Yep. All right. Well, thank you, everyone. This has been Political Coffee. 
uh, with Robin and Tracy. And you see, I have my, my Scorpio mug. Tracy and I are both Scorpios, share the same birthday. And so- yeah, where did you I, get that Scorpio mug? I, I was Bed Bath & Beyond. I saw it and I said, hey. Really? My friend, you know, my friends from college, my friend Marsha is a Scorpio as well. We always talk about Scorpio power. We have like a little chance, Scorpio power and all that. Right. So, uh, yeah. So, Scorpio. Cool. Yep. All right. Well, Tracy, you have a blessed evening. And uh, you, Robin. everybody stay tuned for our exciting special show on Saturday at 2 with Ed Sopralis. Okay. We're out. Bye, everybody. Bye. See you Saturday. See you Saturday.